So last time we have seen some uh, things that would basically just give us the context of the book of Acts because the book of Acts is basically better in the history of the original church, the one of which we are continuation of. Now in, in Acts chapter 1, in the whole book of Acts including chapter 1, we have to keep in mind that the book of Acts is not a handbook of church doctrine, although doctrine does appear in this book. It is primarily a book of firsts, some first things that you know happen in the history of the church. And again, as I pointed out to you many times, it doesn't have the usual ending amen, which means that again, you know, the continuation of the book of Acts is being written out even today. In fact, if you take take a moment to think about what we have accomplished in the last several months, we have been having several firsts in our own history of the continuing Church of God. There are some important dates that I'm sure you might be aware of when it comes that are described events that are described in the book of Acts. One is the crucifixion date. We believe that it was April 25th, the year 31 AD. And then Christ also was showing himself on earth 40 days thereafter. So his ascension would be on Thursday, June 7th AD. And then comes the Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits that we are going to celebrate in a while. And that occurred, the first New Testament Pentecost occurred on Sunday, June 17th, 31 AD. Also note as we go through the book of Acts that Luke is the only gospel which mentions Christ's ascension. So he is the only gospel writer that mentions that. We have from chapter 1 and all the way through chapter 5, 42, basically description of the beginning of the church. And of course, within that we have after the resurrection of Christ, we have his ascension, which are described in chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the first three verses that we have already seen, they are basically greetings. So in verse 1, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The second verse says, Until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So in verse 1, brethren, we see that Jesus began to do and teach. So this is the emphasis in the Gospel of Luke. We are, of course, we're not to be unprofitable hearers only of the word. We are to be the doers of the world as, the, as James, the brother of Jesus Christ, does admonish us in his epistle. So the book of Acts is basically better than a continuation of what Christ was doing after the gospel accounts. So now we have the continuation because now he is in, through his spirit after the first holy day, after the first uh, New Testament Pentecost, he is now present in us, in his people by his spirit. Now we are his body on this earth. So basically the Acts, and without the Amen, the usual ending, and having the, in, in mind the fact that we are continuation of that, brethren, we are now His body, His spiritual body, well, of course, well organized, spiritual body on earth, continuing doing what Jesus Christ was doing while He was here on the earth. Now, so in the book of Acts, we find, you know, transaction deeds, acts of the apostolic men, not all of them were the apostolic men, but we find the, those who were continuation of the work of Christ while he was on the earth. Now in verse 2 we see that Luke gave us commandment that we should wait until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit he had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So gave, he gave commandment to wait in Jerusalem. Parallel to that we can see the Luke account, uh, the account in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24 chapter 24 and in verse 49 he says behold I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry which is stay in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high so he gave the commandment to wait in Jerusalem while we're in, book, in chapter 24 I want to read to you along with you hopefully you're following with me through, I want to read you this section that only appears in the book of in the book of God in the four Gospels, here in the uh, Gospel of Luke. This 
three part, three part, three part, three part division of the Old Testament, brethren. It doesn't appear in the other three Gospels. Why? Because the Jewish people have always understood that the Old Testament is divided into three major parts. The others who are non-Jews, and that was basically the target audience of the Apostle Luke, they didn't understand that. So in this very chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus Christ tells his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses, that's the first division, and the Prophets, that's the second division, and the Psalms concerning me. The Psalms meaning the wisdom writings and so on. So those are the three major parts of the Old Testament. The Jewish people have already understood that, but the non-Jewish people did not. This is why the Apostle Luke has recorded this for us. And then verse 44 says, And he opened their understanding that they might co comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. You see, the witnesses are being mentioned also in the book of Acts. Witnesses of these things. And then, behold, he said and gave them, repeated the promise that he has given them, you know, promise of his Father, which is that they will be imbued, or empowered by the Holy Spirit from on high. And in verse 3, we see that Jesus Christ, in Acts where chapter 1, verse 3, we see that Jesus Christ showed himself after the resurrection. And in fact, brethren, we're going to now to see that the scriptures described 10 different times that Jesus was seen after his resurrection. 10 different times. The first time was to he showed himself to women at tomb, Mary Magdalene and other Mary, the mother of James the Less, they were witnesses to this. And there are three gospel accounts of this showing. In One is in Matthew 27, verse 56 to 61. The other one is in Mark, chapter 15, verse 40. And the third one is in John, chapter 20. So let's just read in John, chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, of course, as he ascended, brethren, he fulfilled that wave sheaf offering that we mentioned uh, during the days of unleavened bread or prior to the days of unleavened bread. The second instance, so that 10 different times, 10 different instances of Jesus Christ manifested himself after his resurrection was in Sunday afternoon because they held his feet. That's written in Matthew chapter 28. This obviously took place after Christ's ascension to his father when he was received back. He, re he regained his old glory that he had before the world was formed, that he had before he was taken on the form of human flesh. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, he says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. The Galilee. As I pointed out to you, brethren, Galilee was populated again by a different people. Jesus Christ, while he was on the earth, he fled to the Galilee because he was afraid that the Jewish people might kill him. Why did he flee to Galilee? The Galilee was populated by another tribe. Remember which tribe remained with Judah after the division of the kingdom of Israel into the northern and southern kingdom. It was the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin 
was in Galilee, which means that basically all the apostles that he called out of the Galilee were basically of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, when we know those little facts, brethren, sometimes the different dimensions and aspects of the word of the word of God come to our mind. The third time that he manifested himself was to Simon. To Simon. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 5, and verse 5 identified with Simon Peter, but the very manifestation of him to Simon is the, uh, basically described only again in one uh, in one gospel account, which will be in Luke chapter 24 again, and that will be verse 33 through 35. Luke chapter 24, verse 33. So there rose up that very that, that, that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread now breaking of bread the two disciples on the road to Emmaus Luke 24 again and Jesus Christ appeared to them. The account is written from verse 13 all the way up to verse 35. So we won't be reading that, but he appeared to the disciples of on Emmaus. Uh, then the fifth instance that he appeared to his disciples was when they were when the ten disciples were assembled behind locked doors. <laughs> well, that's also you know it's recorded again in Luke 24 verse 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. <laughs> you see, they still didn't have faith, brethren. They were still not walking by faith. And verse 38, he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is it. I myself handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said the, uh, this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of, bro of a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. <laughs> yeah, in order to show them that, yeah, it was him was resurrected back to life and who he could manifest now himself into the flesh and even eat and drink just like we will be brethren not be out of necessity in the kingdom of god but just out of joy or out of our own personal pleasure now this same account is also described in john chapter 20 verse 19 through 24 so you see the first five times that jesus christ manifesting himself after his resurrection occurred all on one day then one week later we go now to the uh, Gospel of John, one, uh, verse 21. One week later, he also showed himself to them. Uh, well, they were assembled, and this time he was assembled with them. That will be John 21. And verse should be... Oh, yes, this will be verse 14. Be verse 14. Which says... This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. They had a breakfast by the sea, as chapter 21 describes. Now, he also later in John 21, he also showed himself to seven disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. He also showed himself to 500 people on Mount in, uh, on, uh, Mount in Galilee. That is described in 1 Corinthians. I won't go there, but you can jot it down. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6. Then also in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7, he showed himself to James, his brother, and to other disciples. And then, after 40 days, this is the 10th instance that he showed himself. After 40 days, brethren, Christ ascended from the Mount of Olives. And we read about that account from going on from verse 3 all the way up through verse 12. Now, he ascended bodily. How far into the clouds did Jesus ascend before they could no longer see him? Well, we don't know. 1,000 feet perhaps. I don't know. But interestingly enough, the number 10 
because there are 10 instances that he showed himself to his disciples. According to Bullinger's number in scripture, number 10 is God's number of divine order. Uh, this book, number in scripture, I think, I'm not sure if it's found, if it can be found on internet or not, but I found it, it's interesting, it's Bible based, there is no kind of divination or some kind of deviation from the true doctrine. So anyway, during the ambassador colleges, you know, the book of Bullinger is also, also used as a, as a source. So Bullinger number in scripture, again, yeah, according to his book, it's the number of divine order, which does make sense when we think about uh, about what is this number 10 related to it's related you see to he's bringing into order his his uh, primitive his original church before they were to receive the holy the power of the holy spirit now christ's messages we see in verse, verse 3 it says he was speaking to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god so you see christ's message brethren was all the time only one the kingdom of god the kingdom of god from the very moment that he began preaching in the Galilee, it was the kingdom of God. It was not about his person. It was not about worshipping Christ. It was not about receiving Christ in your heart, brethren. It was the kingdom. The kingdom which, as I explained to you at various times, and the Bible tells us, is the ruling family of God, brethren. We are to be born into the family of God in order to be the ruling family of God. Not to rule like the Gentiles do, brethren, but we are to rule in a way that we serve humanity and all of God's creation. And in doing so, we'll be restoring this earth to its original beauty. We'll be basically bringing back the earth to the state of the Garden of Eden. That is what, that is why God is going to establish his kingdom. That's why God has called us now. That we be trained to become kings and priests in his coming kingdom. And yes, that we will be ruling with him, but not ruling like the Gentiles again. We'll be ruling in a way that means serving humanity. So Christ also gave the final instruction, this very uh, final instru instructions. And uh, in this, before he ascended, you know, to, to heaven. In verse 4, we read that, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. We've just read in Luke chapter 24, what was the promise of the Father? Which he said, you have heard from me. Now, this was a big assembly. He was literally eating with them. We've read about that in Luke chapter 4, 24. And we in from uh, verses 42 through 49. He was eating with them, he was dining with them, he was uh, giving them, you know, literally giving them instructions. And he gave them this commandment. Now, as far as the dates of, or the years of his resurrection, there are different theories out there, I might say. Protestants say, or the so-called Protestants, because now they're in ecumenical union with the mother church in rome so i've got no idea against whom are they protesting actually brethren i do have idea the only thing that they can now protest against will be god's law and god's people which protestants do vociferously do all the time they can constantly denigrate and put down the law of god and also god's people who keep god's law but anyway the protestants as they're still called they believe that the ascension might be from 29 or perhaps 30 a.d the Catholics believe it was 33 AD. The Church of God has always believed it was 31 AD. Now the promise, promise in the Old Testament was that Messiah would appear. As, as you know, the Jewish people were waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. Jesus Christ failed to live up to their expectation because they, they waited for a mighty conqueror, deliverer, who would deliver them out of the occupation of the Roman Empire. So they were waiting in the Old Testament. That was indeed the promise was that Messiah would appear. Yes, he did appear as a meek lamb. He came in human flesh to die as God in flesh because only the total sum of all of our sins could have been forgiven if God in flesh died in our stead, brethren. You remember I was telling you about the Messianic Psalm when we were talking about the Psalm 51 when we talked about repentance, that we are to repent of who we are. When David, King David finally realized 
that it would be the same God whom he was serving in the Old Testament who had to come into flesh and die in order for his sins to be blotted out. So the Old Testament pro promise was that the Messiah would appear. That has been fulfilled. Then the promise in the New Testament was basically Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ had wait for the promise of the Father. And in connection to that, let's remind ourselves of John chapter 14, verse 16. We read this section uh, during the Passover service as we always read the final words and the final prayer of Jesus Christ before he was arrested and crucified. 14 and the verse 16 says, And I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit was leading them, working around them, and then on the third day of the first fruits of their Pentecost, finally was in them. But then the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine in the Old Testament. There is no such doctrine. Yes, it's mentioned in Hebrew, as some of you probably know, as Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, but it's not a doctrine. However, some must have been begotten by the Holy Spirit. No wonder, uh, well, we know about Moses. We know about those who are building the uh, Old Testament temple. We know about King David. We know f about the prophets. Those individuals were certainly, most certainly, imbued by the Holy Spirit. They were begotten by the Holy Spirit. And no wonder they will be in the first resurrection. Then in verse 6, Acts chapter 1 verse 6 he says therefore when they had come together they asked him saying Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel so brethren the message was clear that the kingdom of God and keep this in mind this is very important especially for those who have abolished the teachings and the truth about the identity of Israel. Brethren, the kingdom of God will be at the same time the kingdom of Israel. Because God, after the great tribulation and the day of the Lord, He is going to regather the remnant of physical Israel. And He is going to restore Israel to its promised land. But this time, it will be a different Israel. It will not be rebellious to Israel. It will be Israel led by the Spirit of God. It will be Israel will become the model nation for all the world. And all the nations will want to come and imitate that Israel and worship the same God, the God of Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. All the world will want to emulate that example, brethren. So the kingdom of God, yes, we are not to be ashamed of saying that. And there is nothing racist in that, because I keep repeating this all the time, brethren, all the nations will have to be grafted into Israel. That's the fact. There is nothing racist about that. God is monogamous. He has always been monogamous. In his marriage covenant contract, old covenant, he had one wife, the house of Israel. In the new covenant, he is still monogamous. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he'll have, again, only one wife. Not many wives. He'll have again the house of Israel as his spouse. So all the nations, regardless of their ethnic origin, regardless of any race, it doesn't matter. All the nation, all the races, all the nations will have to be grafted into Israel. So therefore the kingdom of God, be not never ashamed to say that, brethren, will be at the same time the kingdom of Israel. That's what the apostle says. Will you restore to this time, you know, the kingdom to Israel? Now, of course, we don't know. That's the clear message. We just don't know when. Verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, you know, it's not imperative now for you to know. In other words, you know, it's not imperative for you to now know the times and seasons. But yes, what you do know is that it will be the kingdom of God at the same time the kingdom of Israel. You certainly know that the remnant of Israel will have to be gathered into own, own land. It will be ruled by the government of God, composed of God's children, born into that family of God. And also we don't know, we know from Matthew chapter 24, well, you certainly know what Jesus Christ said. We can read and remind ourselves, Matthew 24 verse 36. Jesus Christ says, but of the day, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So his brethren unrevealed. 
No one knows the day or hour. Now, whether Jesus Christ now knows that or not, brethren, it's totally irrelevant. Let us not be entangled into majoring in minors. Whether Jesus Christ now knows that or not, he probably does. But what does that change when it comes to us and our salvation? It doesn't change anything. We don't know. It's not imperative to know times and seasons. But we know the truth. We have the standards. We must be allowing God to work in us through his spirit and build in us his immutable, perfect, righteous character. Brethren, that's imperative. Otherwise, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. So nobody knows that they are our, even though I, have, I will dare to say that in these end times, through his prophet and through the overseer, Dr. Bob Thiel, God has revealed to us something important. He revealed to us Daniel 9, 27, the peace deal, which will be signed on, you know, for seven years. And we know from the scripture, from the, from the prophecies, that in the middle of that peace deal, the beast, the European dictator, is going to break the deal. So in a sense, we do know or we will know the times or seasons. So God is so merciful even to allow us to know that. But that's not primary thing that we should be focused on. We are to be focused on, as I pointed out a couple of hours ago in Serbian message, we are to be focused on allowing God to create in us his character, brethren. That's imperative. Now, the apostles, of course, believed that, you know, event of coming of the kingdom of God and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel were to take place in their lifetime. We see that because he says, you know, they ask him, will you at this time, while we're still here and alive, you know, restore the, spirit, the uh, kingdom to Israel? So they believed that. When that didn't happen, unfortunately, as you remember, the church era, Ephesus church era just basically became sleepy and tired and uh, the button then was passed on to Smyrna. In verse 8, Christ says, but you shall receive power. Notice, brethren, it doesn't say you shall receive person. You shall receive power when the holy spirit so the power is related connected interconnected with the holy spirit it's the power the effective power of god is not the third person when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses now this is interesting to me in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and to the end of the earth Interesting, you'll be witnesses. What did he mean? Well, he meant basically they'll be brethren, eyewitnesses. They will be eyewitnesses indeed of his resurrection. And because there were eyewitnesses, enough of eyewitnesses of his resurrection, as you know, the early apostles and many other martyrs in the early church were willing to give their life for their faith. There were still enough in the first century and even in the second at the beginning of the second century, those who lived at the time of Jesus Christ, who talked to him, who are witnesses of his power, who are witnesses of the first New Testament Pentecost. So why would those martyrs, you know, give their lives for a lie? There were enough eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Now, of course, all of us here now, we are not eyewitnesses of his resurrection. But we have the testimony of those who gave their life for it. And therefore, we believe, and Jesus Christ said that you are blessed to his disciples, you are blessed because you see. Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. Yes, brethren, we are exceedingly blessed. We have so much blessings, thinks about so many things that God has revealed to us, brethren, the world doesn't know. So the Holy Spirit is power, it's authority. It is not a person, it is omnipresent. And we've just noticed, brethren, we'll be witnesses, it says, in three regions which are described, in interestingly enough. Jerusalem. Palestine, or I just love to call it the promised land, that's really the real name, because Romans gave it the, name, the word, the name Palestine. There was never brethren in Palestine there. It was always Judea and Samaria. But anyway, let it be Palestine, the promised land, and Syria. And then he said that the uttermost part of the world. Well, did he mention Tibet? No, brethren, he mentioned the Western world. He mentioned the West, Western world. So then in verse 9, when he, now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So basically, Christ descended out of, out of their sight. 
they could no longer see him but you know they received all the instructions and then he, we read in verse 10 and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel <laughs> normal angels better manifest themselves as men contrary to seraphim and cherubim and white as you probably know symbolizes righteousness in revelation chapter 9 it is well described in verse 8 that to the woman to the bride of christ to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints righteous acts of the saints brethren we have to be the living saints saints are only living those who living people who serve god they're only saints they're no dead saints and righteous acts brethren we have to allow god once again and i'll keep repeating that to you presence of the sabbath is not relevant it is important, it is necessary, it's mandatory, but it's not the paramount. We can all be keeping the Sabbath and not allowing God to work in our characters, brethren. You have got millions of people around the world keeping the Sabbath and the whole, even the holidays, but brethren, their characters are still like the, of the people of the world because they're not allowing God to work and create that character in them. So yes, we keep the holidays, yes, we keep the Sabbath, it's mandatory, but it serves the purpose, brethren. The purpose is to build holy, perfect, righteous character. And after all, as I mentioned in Serbian, I'll mention now in English, why do we keep the Sabbath? Because we want to be different from others? We want to, you know, just live, you know, just show others how different and righteous we are? No, brethren. We do it out of love for God and because we emulate the example of our Father. Because our Father, at the creation week, He instituted the Sabbath. Gave us an example. So basically walking in the footsteps of our father that's all that's how sabbath is important now in verse 11 those two men those two angels they said men of galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven this same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven so here, brethren, we see, what do we see? Well, we see another promise. We see another promise that he will come just as they have seen, they have seen him ascend from heaven. So Christ will return, brethren. But what we now notice here again, the manner of Christ's return is described to us, not the time. Not the time, the manner. And speaking of that manner of his return, let's go to Zechariah chapter 14. And as I say Zechariah 14, I think one of you will smile now because uh, when we had a nice wonderful chat about baptism and stuff, uh, that person mentioned about, well, asked why did God call you? Well, he mentioned going to heaven. Well, I said, no, we'll not be going to heaven. We'll just go to meet in the air Christ and then we'll come back to where, and then I just quoted this verse that was to him a revelation but uh, let us all be reminded he's coming to where Zechariah 14 4 and in that day the day of Christ's return his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east so that's where he ascended from the Mount of Olives he's coming back to the same Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives shall be split into two from east to west making a very large valley half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south then it keeps describing the how the uh, kingdom of god will be established and uh, how those who will not those nations who may not wish to keep the feast of tabernacles will have no rain today it has been very rainy in serbia so we have been reminded what blessing the rain is once upon the time a long time ago brother i used to hate rain but now as a christ follower of christ i realize that the rain is a blessing from god and therefore i no longer hate rain in fact I'm re i rejoice when the rain comes in first thessalonians chapter 4 the manner of christ's return is also again the manner not the time brethren when uh, the first thessalonians chapter 4 uh, the apostle paul this is his first epistle he believed that in his lifetime and the lifetime of the thessalonians jesus christ will return he didn't chapter 4 verse 14 uh, chapter 4 verse 14 says for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who are dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. That's the last final trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So again, the manner. The same manner is described in 1 Corinthians 15 with more details. That those who are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And those who are dead will rise from the dead first. Revelation chapter 19. Let's read from verse 11 through 15 about the manner of Christ's return. Again, not the time, brethren, but the manner Let's not get entangled in time. And let's not worry about who knows. Does Jesus Christ now know that about the day of his return? He probably does. But do angels know about it? Well, who, who, who knows, brethren? It's not important. We as God's people sometimes just get entangled in such irrelevant, irrelevant points. As if, we, as if we are just thirsty and hungry to find some other some other little thing that we have not really understood before brethren there is still enough that we need to understand about this book so we better focus on what we have revealed in it so what is revealed to us in this book is the manner of christ's return not the time of the day but we are given the science of the time and yes i'm certain that even as his return approaches based on that peace deal we will be able to even know the time or to at least suppose the time but that's not relevant brethren again we can know all the times and all the dates if we do not allow God to work in us, with us, change who we are and create in us perfect, immutable, holy character. All the dates do not count, count as nothing. And any knowledge counts as nothing. The knowledge by itself is useless. Revelation 19 verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Faithful and true, brethren, does this ring the bell to you? Where else does he say he's faithful and true? He doesn't say that to the Philadelphians. Philadelphians obviously understand that. He says that to the Laodiceans. They obviously do not have full faith that he's faithful and true, and whatever he said, he will fulfill. They obviously have some doubts about whether the Bible is really, whether the Bible really means what it says. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Let's now not get entangled. Well, no one knows. Does anyone else now know his, that name? Except, you know, it doesn't matter, brethren. Verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, Logos in, in, in Greek. And the arm is in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. In Zechariah 14, that's described how he'll in Armageddon, he'll strike the nations and defeat them. And we will be with him, brethren. We are also part of this, of this army robed in white and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron that's a symbol of authority of course he's not going to be smashing people with a rod of iron he himself treads the wine press of the of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords the manner of his return and this brethren day the pinnacle of the day of the lord will be his return and if you do not still distinguish between the the, the, the the great tribulation the day of the Lord no problem you know tell tell me about that so that we can distinguish those two things tell me about that that we can you know have sermons that cover those subjects do not be afraid to tell me if there is something that you do not understand not that I understand everything perfectly but we need to understand some basic things the great tribulation of the day of the Lord and the heavenly signs in between are very important things to be understood in those those are the events in the three and a half last years before Christ's return. So hesitate not to say, I do not understand it. Could you please, you know, could you please explain it? And if I don't, if I fail to explain it because English is not my native tongue, somebody else will explain it to you in your native tongue. So we'll be patient and we'll be explaining things until we all grasp it. It is important. So the descent, what we see, brethren, from this very description, I only didn't read 1 Corinthians 15, but you can read it for yourself, verse 45 through 53. Descent of Jesus Christ will be visible. 
it's not going to be secret it's going to be visible and you know this verse all these verses actually prove that the reward of the saved is not heaven jesus returns from heaven to the mount of olives we have read in zechariah chapter 14 verse 4. so the reward is ruling over the earth ruling over the, those populations of the people who will survive the great tribulation at the day of the Lord. That's the reward of the saved. Now we come to, we are in back in Acts chapter 1. We've come now to verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now Sabbath day journey tradition, it says it was like, uh, 2,000 cubic feet, I think, which will be like three and a half miles, basically wall to wall in a city. Now, Mount of Olives, as far as its distance from Jerusalem, I think was about three and a half miles. Luke in verse 52 and 53 of chapter 24 describes that. In any case, after dissension, they went to Jerusalem and they continued worshiping in the temple there was still the temple there in jerusalem and as you probably know from the history i think dr teal has pointed it out quite quite often and so will i as you know brethren that uh, from the history the true believers continued to worship for a long time in the synagogues again why well there was nothing pagan in the synagogues the synagogues were still teaching the old testament law they were also teaching that Messiah would come. Of course, they didn't understand that. But, you know, the teachings of the law, there was still no, the new, there was no New Testament still. The law being expounded and taught, you know, was only traditionally being preached at the synagogue. So there was nothing pagan there, nothing wrong as far as God's law and God's doctrine is concerned. So for a long time, they continued to worship along with their, with their fellow citizens, fellow men, fellow women, fellow Jews. The first followers of Christ were Jewish people, basically. And the first persecution which happened of Christ's disciples happened in Jerusalem after the martyrdom of Stephen. So the first martyrdom, the first martyrs for the Christian faith, you might say, were Jews. And according to the Fox's Book of Martyr, I mentioned this and I'll mention it again because it's important, in that persecution, 2,000 followers of Christ of Jewish descent were murdered along with one deacon who is mentioned in Acts chapter 6, Nicanor. Now, after the ascension, so they went to Jerusalem, and they rented quarters. In verse 13, it says, And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphe Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. So those were the rented quarters. I think some commentaries say that those rented quarters might have been uh, the house of Mark's mother, Mark, the author of, of the gospel, the gospel of Mark, because it seems that she, uh, his mother was very wealthy, had a large house in Jerusalem, and that was probably the house where they even stayed, uh, as they rented the house, they probably stayed in that house all the way up to the feast of first fruits all the way up to, to to the pentecost in that house remember they were staying in a house the house was shaken and was filled with the uh, flames of fire and they began speaking uh, understandable languages of all those nations gathered in jerusalem that house was most likely the house of mark's mother then we have verse 14 these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So alas, you remember, as I gave that sermon about the real Mary of the Bible, alas, here is Mary. No, Mary was not converted. But now after the resurrection of Christ, there she was waiting for her children to be obviously imbued by the power of the Holy Spirit. As you remember, brethren, there were 120 people. Of those 120 people, many of those, I would think, were Christ's, Christ's uh, uh, relatives. His mother, his brothers, his, his sisters, uh, his cousins, his aunts, probably uh, the parents of, of John the Baptist. No, it doesn't say in the Bible, but you know, by logic, by the common sense, you would just conclude that. 
because you remember the interaction between uh, between Elizabeth and Mary as they were waiting, you know, as, as they were exchanging their greetings and waiting for the birth of their sons. So yes, you know, the common sense will tell us that they were there. Many of those were his his relatives. And it's not nothing unusual that God, in at least in the first five, first stages of his church, worked with families. Nowadays, it seems it's not, it's not always the case. I cannot say it's not. It's not the case at all, because we have one example of right here of Texas, for example, and there are other examples, you know, we can point out. So yes, God still works with families. That's nothing unusual. We would wish some of us, Many of us would wish that he would work more with families, <laughs> but it's not the case. It doesn't seem to be such a frequent case now. In any case, we have the women. Now, who were those women? And then we have his brethren as well. Well, his woman, those women would be Mary Magdalene, Luke, because Luke is the author of the book of Acts. Luke in, chapter, in his gospel, chapter 8 and verse 2, he mentions... And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom he had come seven demons. So Mary Magdalene is there. So the mother of Jesus here is the Mary Magdalene, the one who was cleansed of those seven demons. Then there was Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other Mary that was mother of James the Less. She's also mentioned in several places in the Bible, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 56 to 61. And in the Gospel of Mark, we'll read chapter 15 in the Gospel of Mark and verse 40 she's mentioned in Mark 40 it says there was all there were also women looking on from afar among whom were Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome so Mary the mother of James the less is also mentioned so we have these women now and we have brethren obviously his brethren here are his physical brothers and sisters and we assume, of course, that they were part of those 120. Uh, but the fact that the women are being underlined, brethren, is obviously for good reason. It just shows that the church that God was building was not a male chauvinist church. And in fact, as you read even the uh, history of the true church, in some places... In some congregations, they were basically who were called were women rather than men. So no, there is no shamanism in the Church of God. Yes, of course, the sexes have different talents and different things. We have different brains. <laughs> we certainly know that, males and females. But there is no shamanism of either case. God is not a chauvinist, so obviously he underlines the women probably because of the Roman society of that time as well, because which was kind of chauvinistic. For example, one of those stupidities that I've, you have read about the Roman society is that your relatives uh, on your mother's side were considered to be weaker relatives. And those relatives on your father's side were considered to be stronger relatives. I mean, what kind of, what kind of division that is? Where did they get that rubbish from, brethren? I've heard that one, uh, several years. Uh, my, my, my first comment was, really? Well, I said, all the relatives of Jesus Christ we read in the Gospels are on his mother's side. Surprise, surprise. So you see, in the Hebrew way of thinking, brethren, in God's way of thinking, there is no chauvinism. There are no weaker and stronger relatives. Relatives are relatives on mother's side or father's side, regardless. So therefore, God is, I think, is underlying the women to show once again he is building, he's not building a male chauvinistic church, not at all. Then we come to verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples to get all together. The number of names was about 120. And then he starts to preach. So we have 120 disciples here. We have 120 disciples. Now he, stand, he stood up because now Judas needs to be replaced. He betrayed Jesus Christ. So he not, they not he need to be replaced. Among those 120 disciples again, I presume many of those many of those were Christ's relatives. That makes perfect sense to me. Now, disciple or disciple means learner or student. Interestingly enough, for those of you who love mathematics, arithmetics, and numbers, 120 is also a kind of type of completion. Because you have 10 times 12 equals 120. We have seen number 10 
as Bully just says, it's a type of divine order. We have 12. We know very well what 12 means. 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel, 120. And also 120 were required, as uh, perhaps you, you may know that, they were required to settle a civil matter. So Luke may have done this on purpose due to Jewish law. You know, to show that, you know, in the Jewish society, 120 were required to settle a civil matter. So he might have done this on purpose. Then verse... Where are we? In verse, we're in verse 15, right? And, you know, oh, Peter stood up. Yes, verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So, basically, Judas is now here, now introduced in this, in this discourse by the Apostle Peter. Then in verse 18, uh, he says, oh, verse 17, For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Then in verse 18, he says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. Well, burst asunder, I think it says, uh, 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 how does it say here, that his entrails gushed out. In some translations it says, burst asunder in the midst. Uh, I think from the Greek language, uh, it was like something like to clang, to crack, to crash like a falling tree. Now the plausible explanation is that those entrails may mean, you know, burst open in the middle due to ineptness in trying to hang himself. Dama, dama, blood in Hebrew. Yes, that's right. My cousin Shona, who knows Hebrew, does recognize those words. So... He hit rocks below. He was trying, obviously, to hang himself. It was sloppy kind of action, so he hit rocks below. But the fact that's plausible explanation, brethren. However, the fact is that we have in the Bible one fact that we know. Now, again, let's not get entangled now into those little details that we don't need to know, because it seems there are always people among us that just want to get those little details that are really hard to explain or hard to really know. <laughs> Nobody has been revealed and even in Serbia there were some people who were you know I thought were, were called being called by God and they would always ask me some impossible questions that nobody has answered to you know questions that nobody could know which shows showed me that well eventually they just departed from the truth which showed to me that they were not really interested in uh, uh, serving God but in just asking endless questions and finding excuses not to serve him we brethren not need to keep asking endless questions to which there is no answers. One of these days we'll know the answers. What we what is required of us is to live by what we know, to live by what has been revealed to us. Because that what has been revealed to us is the are the factors that, with the working of the Holy Spirit in us, will be building holy, righteous, immutable spiritual character that is required for us to inherit the kingdom of God. So we need to be focused on what we know. What we know for a fact is that Judas committed suicide in remorse. Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. That's what we know. Now Jew, Jews are very tied to importance of burial, by the way, brethren. That kind of importance is present even today. And they try, always try to bury dead as close to Jerusalem as possible. And also it's interesting, in, uh, you know, in their custom, uh, their tombs are basically turned toward Jerusalem. I've seen that in one of the villages where I lived for a year, in the north, northern part of Serbia, there were rumors about a Jewish, an abandoned Jewish cemetery, and it was all in thickles and bushes but however two younger residents of that village my good friends told me you know there is a word that there is a jewish jewish cemetery 
here and there. So we went into that direction and sure enough, in all those thickets and those bushes, we found the, uh, the tombstones. The tombstones from before the Second World War. But it was just so covered with thickets and, and, and trees that you wouldn't even know that there was a cemetery there. And nearby were the fields that the local peasants were working on. And we just began cutting those thickets and bushes. We took some pictures. I've, I've, I've you know, preserved, I've collected some of those pictures and I've just preserved them for a memory. Interestingly enough, all the tombs that we found, they were basically empty. I guess they were, they were uh, robbed by nearby gypsy settlement there were no any valuables there of course but it was like you know small rooms small bricket rooms but then i realized all of them were turned to the same direction toward jerusalem obviously the jewish people have some concept of the resurrection so i guess they think you know they believe as they'll just rise from the dead that they should be facing straight in jerusalem so anyway the burial was still very important so i guess that's why this Think about Judas committing suicide was was recorded. Now we may wonder what was Judas' motives. All right. Well, in John chapter twelve and in verse six, we read that Judah Judah was Judas was uh, a treasurer and thief. This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So Judas didn't presume Jesus as a lamb led to the slaughter, brethren. Again, you know, just like the whole entire Jewish nation, Jewish nation, he basically disappointed the Jewish nation. <laughs> they didn't expect a lamb led to the slaughter. They expected a mighty deliverer who will just crush the Roman Empire and make the uh, house of Judah the ruling nation on the earth. But when Judas realized that Christ was actually going to die, he basically hung himself. Now, of course, there is also this question to which we don't really have an answer and we don't need to spend too much time on. But the question is, well, in which resurrection will Judas come up to? What is the resurrection he'll come up to? Well, obviously, will he be in the first resurrection? The obvious answer, I guess, brethren, you would say no. Will he be in the second resurrection? We don't know, but it is possible, brethren. Will he be in the third resurrection? Well, it is also possible. It is also possible. We don't know, so probably. There are two possibilities. We have no definite answer, and we shouldn't be again again dwelling on that. We should be dwelling on what we do know and what we do understand. In, Mar in uh, Mark chapter 14, speaking of the third resurrection, will, will he be in the third resurrection? Well, Mark 40 verse 21 says, The Son of Man... Indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. So will he be in the third resurrection? Well, possible. The Son of Man indeed goes. That was Jesus Christ. As it is written of him, you know, by woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be good for him if he had never been born. So brethren, we don't know. We don't know in which resurrection Judas would be. However, what we know is that we have in Acts chapter 1, we are in verse 20 now. We know that the word bishopric in Greek does appear here in verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. The word office his office as overseer, obviously. Bishopric is the Greek word. Related to this verse, we basically have two verses in two psalms. Because God's Spirit revealed meaning of these two psalms. It's Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And therefore God inspired Peter to say exactly this and quote from the psalm. Now it's a good example of how the Bible interprets itself. Yes, the Bible doesn't need anybody else to interpret the bible interprets itself and we who follow that method certainly have a good grasp and understanding of the bible psalm 69 verse 25 
Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. And 109. And verse 8. 109 verse 8. Let his days be few. And let another take his office. Bishop, his office as an overseer. So we go now to verse 21. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. How beautiful. Witness of his resurrection, brethren, you see. Because there were eyewitnesses of his resurrection, people later who were not eyewitnesses were willing to die. None of us today is eyewitness of his resurrection, but we believe on the account of the apostles. And we are blessed because of that. Those who don't believe, those who don't live by the faith, those who are lukewarm brethren will have to prove their loyalty in the great tribulation. So we see in verse 22 that you know there was somebody to replace Judas and Matthias and Joseph had to have been witnesses along with the apostles. And of course, in the following verses, we see that Matthias is chosen to replace Judas. Verse 23. And they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen. So, we're talking about Matthias now in the prayer for, you know, for, for the one to be chosen. 25. To take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles so basically we have we see that you know matthias was appointed by casting lots interesting commentary on this brethren is barclay's barclay's commentary he says it may seem strange to us that the method was that of casting lots but amongst the jews it was the natural thing to do because all the offices and duties in the temple were settled that way the names of the candidates were written on stones the stones were put into a vessel, and the vessel was shaken until one stone fell out. And he whose name was on that stone was elected to office. Interesting, isn't it? So, brethren, we also need to know that this was the last time, and is the last time in God's church, that the casting of lots is ever used. After this, they were given the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit will lead them into truth, as it says. We'll just read for the concluding hymn, uh, concluding hymn for the concluding verse, Matthew chapter 18. After that, we'll have a concluding hymn as well, and perhaps even two, because I feel that Maestro Sloba is concocting something in his mind. So in Matthew chapter 18, we will read that they were given the Holy Spirit that will lead them into all the truth. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name i am there in the midst of them and in john 16 again we read this during the passover service and in verse 13 however when it the spirit of truth has come it will guide you into all truth for it will not speak on its own authority but whatever it hears it will speak and it will tell you things to come 